Hey guys, this is Darkman again, and we're back with another creepypasta. First and foremost, it's going to be a long guys intro, so if you want to skip all the BS, I'll say go directly to 220. I apologize for the long wait and not making a story in a minute. I've been so busy with the work in school. I had like two jobs. And, you know, try to make that money. Now I can complete school. Didn't really complete it though. Now, I finally finished underneath the Arctic Void. Yes, it's going to be a good one too. So the wait was well worth it. The story is about. Like underneath what's underneath Antarctica. A lot of crazy shit happens. I love sci-fi horror stories. Now this story it has a long build up. So bear with me, please. Anyways, I can't tell you too much. Or the story will be ruined, and I cannot have that happen. But now that it's nighttime, where your fear is the highest, just sit back, relax, eat your popcorn, and drink your Coke. Or whatever the hell you're snacking on. And enjoy the story. <laughs> it has been days since I've had a proper meal. The freezing arctic winds are raging outside, hitting against the house with fierce blows. The only thing I have consumed in the past several days were half a tube of toothpaste and water that is still surprisingly running from the faucet. I don't have much time now. My fingers are already becoming numb from the frigid air circulating in this bathroom after taking my gloves off to write this message to tell you what truly lurks beneath this large piece of ice known as Antarctica. The events leading up to the present have been over a course of five years. First and foremost, let me introduce myself. My name is Dr. James Hendrickson. In the current year, is 2167. Everything started in the year 2162 when my partner Professor William Harrison, several other geographers and I were all sitting in the meeting room. We were discussing the possibility of land being under the large structure of ice we currently were on. Okay, now we all know that Antarctica is the fifth largest continent on earth and is the largest landmass that has the most undiscovered terrain. I have been thinking to myself ever since I was a child about what is underneath all of this ice. Everyone learned about the theory of Pangaea when all the continents were together but then spread apart like missing pieces to a puzzle. Antarctica was one of those pieces to the puzzle but got covered in frozen terrain. As scientists, we need to dig up the missing past from millions of years ago and discover what we are truly on top of. Yes, we all know land is under here, but what does this land look like? I see where you're going with this, James, but how are we going to dig up this past under all these hard layers of ice? Professor William Harrison had responded. I'm glad you asked that, Will. 
we'll have to build a machine powerful enough that could dig into the thick ice. To do this, we need some of the most illustrious mechanical engineers around the world. How long will this machine take to even build? Professor John Whitman had asked. Well, John, to be frank, perhaps a decade. A decade? William had shouted with shock. No, I know what you all are thinking, but you have to give it a chance. Great discoveries take time and patience. Heck, that's what anything you want. Several of the men in the room were babbling to each other about how my idea was insane. Man, just imagine how much notoriety we'll gain once we discover what is underneath us. They all looked at each other and then looked at me with approval with my project. The meeting lasted around a total of five hours. We all discussed who we thought would be a great choice for the job. At the end of the meeting, we chose three men. The first person lives in Albany, New York, whose name was Jacob Smith. This man was responsible for the subway with high speeds that could reach up to 700 miles per hour. The second person's name was Nigel Umu, who lived in Nigeria, Africa. He was responsible for the AP-90, which is a jet that can be undetected by any radar and can become transparent in the sky. It basically can become invisible. Last but not least, my most favorite and personal choice, Chan Li. Chan lives in Japan. He is responsible for the device that allows one human to dematerialize and instantly travel to another part of the world to another machine inside the lab located in Canada. Yes, only one human can be transported, but imagine how much it could be improved as time goes on. We all exited the meeting room in the afternoon. I went to the sourcing department and our members contacted those three men. I then headed home. I lived in a small city approximately three miles from the base. It was your average city filled with restaurants, several hotels, apartments, houses, and the other entities you would expect to find in a large town. As I drove my car out of the parking lot, it took me little to no time at all to get home since they shoveled and sodded the roads. I lived in a small house because I wasn't married or had any kids. When I walked in the front door, I poured myself a glass of Jack, relaxed on the couch, and watched the news. There was nothing interesting on today. The only thing they discussed was about some boring ass penguins and polar bears. Later on, I got hungry and ordered some pizza from a local Italian restaurant called Giagino's. The delivery driver arrived within 30 minutes, like they had promised. I tipped him a $20 bill because I myself was once a delivery driver and got constantly stiffed by cheap ass people. You should have seen that look on his face. I could tell I made his night of endless rude customers better. I flopped back on my couch and watched some ho old horror movies that predated the 90s and ate my extra large meat lover's pizza. Every last bite was filled with gooey melted cheese, thick crumbled sausage and pepperoni along with bacon. I ate everything. <laughs> I know what you're already thinking. I'm some fat piece of shit, but I'm only 26 and I have an extremely high metabolism. In other words, I'm skinny as fuck and can never gain weight. After eating the pizza, I fell asleep on my couch into a deep sleep. I woke the next morning with nothing but the tangy taste in my mouth you get from after you eat food and go to bed without brushing your teeth. My clock had read 6.30 a.m. I had to be at the lab by 8, so I took my time and experienced a nice hot shower. The parking lot at the facility was empty as usual, since I'm one of the first people to get there. When I headed in the building, my phone's time had read 7.43. Early as usual, James, Professor William had said when I, we met in the elevator. You know my motto, Will, if you're on time, you're late, and if you're early, you're on time. 
we both head into the sourcing department to ask them if they have contacted those three men. Good morning, gentlemen. Did you all contact those three men we talked about yesterday? One of them had replied yes. They will be on their way heading on the plane we sent out for them. They should be here within the next several days. Will and I headed out towards my office just to chat and wait for everyone else to come in. So what's new, Will? Ah, uh, nothing, man. Just the same old bullshit, just a different day. Did you hear about Greg's wife? She's sleeping with Joe the Snowplower. Immediately after Will said that, the other man walked in, including Greg. There was an awkward silence when we both saw Greg until it was all cut short by the new intern, Jake Harris, that had just joined our team last month. I've been up all last night thinking of this project. Same here, Jake, I replied. Everyone in the room began discussing the project. Around 12, we all headed to the cafeteria for lunch. Since we all worked for the company, everyone got hot free meals every day they worked. The food was actually pretty good since our meals were prepared by some of the most high-end chefs around the world. Greg left to go eat somewhere else for lunch. While he was gone, everyone else filled me in a little more on his wife having an affair with Joe. My face was filled with awe as they all told me the dirty secrets that dwelled within our small town. I even laughed a little at the crazy shit they told me. I kind of felt bad for Greg because he was such a great guy. But I guess that's what we see on the outside of their home. Today's lunch was a Philly cheesesteak along with a side of fries. I wasn't lying when I said our food was amazing. Since our lunch breaks were an hour long, Greg came back just in time to eat with us. We all joked about stuff that happened around the town. Of course we didn't mention his wife cheating on him. These guys were like brothers to me. We spent hours together in this building, working, laughing, even fighting from time to time. When our lunch break was over, we all headed to our offices and did our daily tasks. My job was to monitor the ice activity. Basically, I made sure that everyone would be safe if a massive earthquake were to happen. When there's an earthquake in an Arctic zone like this, it's way more dangerous because there are pools of water and caverns underneath our town. I know what you're thinking. It was pretty dumb to do this, build our city here. But hey, the view of the ocean is amazing, and we're all going to die someday, right? Hours went by as I stared blankly at the computer screens. Nothing ever happened while I worked there. It actually surprised me and still that no calamities took place while I looked over those monitors. So, if an earthquake ever did happen, I would probably freak the fuck out because I'm so used to it being calm here. I mean, we should probably have a drill just in case some shit goes down. Five o'clock found the cane, which signaled my time to leave. When I exited the building, I waved goodbye to all my colleagues and headed home. Joe went out earlier that morning to plow the streets, so I got home pretty quick, just like yesterday. As soon as I got home, I took out some chicken breast to stall for dinner. I've been eating pretty unhealthily lately, so I decided it was time to treat my body right. While the food was thawing out, I flicked on Netflix and watched The Seven Deadly Sins. It's an amazing ass anime. If you don't know what it is, you're wasting your life away. When H strolled around, I made sauteed chicken breasts with a side of spinach and headed to bed. The next morning was the start of a new weekend. Since I didn't work, I decided to relax and have some time for myself to run some errands. Today, I had to go grocery shopping pay some bills, and go to the bar with the boys later on in the night. My grocery store trips were usually an hour long. I loved taking my time to look at all the great sales they had. Since it was Saturday, the store was packed. After my great expedition at Walmart, I headed home to pay off those bills I had. 
I'm always a one month ahead of everything because I hate being late and getting those dumbass fees. Will texted me to make sure we were still on for tonight at the local bar downtown. Of course I told him yes. I headed out to the bar around 10 and came back at home at 2 in the morning. Memories of the bar were a blur because of how many drinks I had. What was it? Five shots of Hennessy? Two shots of 1800 silver? I don't even remember. Sunday, I just laid in bed all day because of my hangover. The only times I got up were to use the bathroom or to get a bite to eat. My Sundays were usually like that, so it didn't bother me. I awoke Monday around the usual time for work and headed off on that icy road. When I got there, the parking lot was filled earlier than it usually was. I walked in the building. I was greeted by the leader of the research team, Cliff Lockwood. Good morning, James. I'm happy to inform you the three men that will help out with the project are finally here. Cliff led me to the meeting room where everyone else was waiting for me. I looked in the room and saw three unfamiliar faces and just knew it had to be them. The first man was tall, slender, and had dark skin, the color of the night sky. He spoke up with a deep voice, introducing him as Nigel Umbu. I already knew his name before he even told me. The next man was Jacob Smith. Jacob was Caucasian, short, chubby, with a hairy body and a full beard. Last but not least was my personal choice, Chan Lee. Chan was an average height, male, but very skinny. He also looked young for his age of 28. He could honestly pass off as a 13 year old. After the three men introduced themselves, we all discussed the project we were working on. There were a few arguments that broke out on the budget, how it would work and when we'd start. We missed lunch that day because of how intense the meeting was. The discussion was to be finished the next day. When Tuesday came, we still didn't finish the discussion. It didn't even surprise me. Something this big takes time and patience to properly plan out. I headed home right after work and saw Greg and Joe arguing on the side of the road. I got out my car and tried to defuse the situation. Greg's wife Sarah was trying to hold Greg back. I came in and held Joe back. The whole commotion took 10 minutes to settle. Apparently, Greg walked out of work and saw Joe kissing Sarah in the snow truck. A couple weeks later, Greg filed a divorce. He would always come in late to the meeting, so we excused him for one month and just spoke to him on his webcam about the plan. We eventually finished the plan for the entire project within a whole year. By this time, Greg was a single man, and his slut of a wife Sarah was with Joe. Tom really did fly by while all of it happened. That night, all the people at the facility had a huge celebration before the big date hit to start the project. The budget for the project was 3.5 million American dollars. We estimated it would take four years to complete. A job ad was immediately posted online. We were paying 50 people, 40K a year to help us out. The day to begin officially working on a machine to drill through all this ice officially began April 19th of 2163. I knew the task would be hard, but we had hardworking men and women on our side to get the job done. Those four years passed by in the breeze. It all surprises me as to how fast time flew by. Kinda feels like yesterday we were just in that meeting room discussing our project, but now it's finally done. The project took place several miles from the research lab. The big test was finally on to see if our drill can dig a big enough hole to reach the bottom of Antarctica which has an average length of five miles in ice. The three men, Jacob, Nigel, and Sean, along with several other staff members and I got inside the giant drill that we now call Maxim. 
but he turned on Maxim. A loud rumbling noise echoed throughout the machine and everything had begun to vibrate. Maxim finally began digging inside of the ice. As we got deeper underground, the small rays of sunlight that illuminated inside the machine were finally disappearing, getting ate up by the darkness. The lights inside Maxim finally cut on along with the headlights that showed the drill in front of us going at the ice. During the whole trip down, everyone was quiet. The atmosphere was so tense because of discovering the unknown. Within 20 minutes, we finally reached the bottom. The sound of steam exited the vents inside of Maxim, indicating its hard work. Everyone aboard the machine exited one by one as the doors opened. We all looked in awe. We were inside of a cavern of some sort. Everyone shook each other's hand for a job well done. Something that took us several years to plan and complete was finally accomplished. Tears of joy streamed down my face as I gave Will a hug. Well, this place isn't going to explore itself, William has said. Everyone suited up with the gear and walked forward to discover what lurked underneath us. We gathered some ice samples to study back at the lab. The cavern was massive. We only walked for one mile and still couldn't see an end. I decided to end the exploration there and continue the next day. Everyone walked back to Maxim to start our journey back up to the surface. Back at the lab, there was a swarm of people asking about our discovery and what we saw. Security then came in, backed off the people so we could go inside. The ice samples were examined as soon as we got in. Apparently the ice samples we got were over 2.5 million years old. This shocked everyone in the lab. We all got inside the meeting room to discuss what we'd do the next day. I suggested going deeper until we found the end. It was then decided to go back tomorrow morning and do a bit more exploring. Everyone left the building and headed home. When I got home, I watched some TV and ordered some Chinese takeout. General Souls chicken with pork fried rice, a fucking classic, right? Around 10, I passed out on my couch. My alarm clock woke me up around 6.30. I got ready for work and headed to the lab. When I arrived, everyone was ready to head underground. We got inside Maxim and proceeded with our mission. When we got to the bottom, everyone headed off deeper into the cavern. It took about 20 minutes to reach where we left off. As we got further into the cave, it got darker. Even the strong flashlights that can illuminate 50 feet in front of us were getting swallowed by the darkness. A couple of staff members complained about being dizzy and nauseous. They were sent back up while eight others and I continued. It took about one more minute to reach the end. Will and I looked around. There was nothing but a cave's wall. We all looked in disappointment at the fact we wasted so much money and time for nothing. I yelled in frustration. That's when I heard a crack from on the cave floor in front of us. We all immediately looked down and saw a rock formation that looked slightly different from the stone we were standing on. I grabbed a pickaxe and with one hard hit I cracked open a, a dark hole that led deeper underground. The smell of musky air hit my nose as soon as it was open. I flashed my light down and saw the bottom it was about a 10 feet drop. I told one of the men to pass me some rope so I could safely climb down. Once I got to the bottom, I stepped in a puddle of water that surrounded the entire area. I told them to come down. One by one, they transcended the rope, while three others waited up on top in case anything happened. We all flashed our lights around and saw paintings on the cavern walls. Pictures of tall stick figures with clear faces and dark eyes. There were people all lined up in front of a tall stick figure, getting lifted up into the air and getting something sucked out of their bodies. It appeared to be smoke. On the other side, I saw people fighting them. 
There were so many people on the ground with a dark puddle underneath them. I even saw piles of people that were stacked up on top of each other. The images were so gruesome that I began to feel nauseous. Come look at this, Nigel had yelled out. We all walked to where he was and saw a dark tunnel. Everyone walked through it. I felt a sense of danger when I walked through that tunnel. The passage led to us to a small area with three long rocks that formed a coffin-like shape. Everyone examined them and wondered what they were. They were made of some type of stone we've never seen before. It looked like a combination of steel and granite rock, if that makes sense. This is an amazing discovery. Just imagine what's inside one of these, Jacob has shouted. We need to carry these back to the lab to get them studied, Will has said it. Maybe we shouldn't do this, guys. I've got a bad feeling about this. Are you a fool, James? Do you really think we just leave this discovery untouched just because of some shitty painting we saw on the walls back there? Will has shouted at me. I just kept silent because everyone else seemed as if they were on Will's side. Before we left, Will snapped some photos of our discovery. We all headed through the tunnel and back to the lab. Once we got back, everyone discussed what we had found. I tried to tell them about the paintings on the wall, but they wouldn't listen and told me to leave if I didn't have anything smart to say. Religion is just some control mechanism people use that world order, James. And from what we saw on those walls, looked like there was some type of god people worshipped back in that era. I just looked at all of them in disbelief and walked out without uttering a single word. When I got home that night, I just laid in bed to rest. It was a long ass day and I needed it. That night I had a dream. No, as a matter of fact, I had a nightmare. I woke up in the field during a snowstorm. I got up and walked around, lost and confused. In the distance, I heard the screams of terrified people. As I got closer, I could see a very tall structure. It was so tall that I couldn't even see the top. There were people surrounding it walking inside with boulders. They were so malnourished. I was surprised they could even lift the boulders, let alone walk. There were so many people going inside and out, I then realized their skin was gray. When I walked closer, none of them had noticed me at all. It's as if as they were in a trance. A man and woman came running out of the building with looks of terror on their faces, and behind them came a tall skinny creature with gray skin. I woke up as soon as I saw its body. Beads of sweat dripped down my forehead. I turned over and checked my clock. It had read 2.37 a.m. Holy fuck, all I got was a couple hours of sleep? It's safe to say I didn't get any more sleep that night and went straight to work on edge and exhausted. When I got to the lab, no one was there, besides some of the people from the research department. They told me everyone was already at the work site getting ready to head underground and bring up those stone structures we found yesterday. I just stared at them. What's wrong? She had asked me. I told her nothing and just walked to the site. Everyone was getting inside Maxim to head down. I ran up and begged them not to go. Don't start with this bullshit, James. If you don't want to go, just head back to the lab and drink some coffee. Well, I said. Dr. James, if you feel troubled, I'll protect you. Nigel had told me. All of them besides him had laughed. And just gotten in and headed down with them. We all traveled on machines down there to bring back the stone structures with ease. It took about 72 hours to complete the process because of the size of the stones. 
when the stones finally got back to the lab. Nigel, Jacob, and Chan examined them. Five came around and I headed home while they stayed at the lab to examine the stones overnight. I ordered myself some Chinese takeout again and stayed up until two in the morning watching some dumb TV show when I got a call from the lab. As I, soon as I answered, Chan was on the phone, breathing hard. He was yelling in the phone, telling me to come to the base immediately. I asked him what for, but the line disconnected. I got my keys, threw on my coat, and rushed out the door. I sped on the road and got to the lab within three minutes. When I walked inside the building, Chan rushed up to me and told me to follow him. He pulled my arm and ran all the way to the lab room where Nigel, Jacob, and Will were. They all looked up as soon as I walked in. There was nothing but the look of terror in their faces. You need to come look at this, James, Jacob had said. When I walked to where he was, I saw it. The stones were on an examining table, but one of them had a crack in it. Protruding from the stone was what appeared to be part of a leg with gray, clear, and smooth skin. What the hell happened here? I had asked. The room went silent for several seconds, which felt like minutes. When you left, we, we, we tried to chip off some of the stone, to see what it was, but nothing we tried worked until we used some chemicals to melt it. That's when the stone cracked open when we saw this. Jacob has spoken up. Images of the cave paintings we all saw ran through my head. We need to take whatever the hell these stones are back down there. Apparently there's a reason why they were sealed the fuck up. James, I know we're all scared, but that's not going to happen. Will had chimed in. Are you fucking mad, man? You saw those paintings. Have some goddamn common sense and agree with me. We got into an argument, which then turned into a fist fight. I'm not letting five years of hard work go down the drain just because you're of your idiotic beliefs and dreams, James. A security guard had come in and dragged me out. Guys, come on, what the hell? I had asked. They all just stared at me and shook their heads. The security guard threw me out of the building and made sure I exited the parking lot. When I got home, I got a call from the lab saying my services weren't needed anymore without any given reason. Before I could talk back to whoever had called me, they hung up. I just sat on the couch, enraged at the whole team, just kicking me out like that. I also felt a sense of danger, as if something horrible was going to happen soon. It has been several days since I've been fired. I tried calling Will to apologize for fighting with him, but he hasn't returned any of my calls. Neither have any of the guys at the lab. I drove past there for the past few days and cars were parked in the same spot each day. It appeared no one had left the building because there was a pile of snow building up in front of the entrance doors. I knew something was going on and that I had to go inside to check on everyone. So on Friday night, I headed over there. When I walked in, the power was out. So I had to take the stairs and use my flashlight. The whole building was silent. The only thing I could hear were my footsteps. I was on edge when I opened the lab room. There were cracked beakers on the floor and papers scattered everywhere. The smell of decaying flesh hit me so hard, I almost vomited. I saw a black figure standing 15 feet away from me. Will? I didn't get any response. I walked closer and my jaw dropped. There were four other people in the room, 
just staring out the window. I don't even think they were human. Their bodies were emaciated and gray. They stared blankly out the broken windows at the moon with eyes that had no pupils. I dropped to the floor and scrambled away when I heard a faint coughing coming from the corner of the room. I flashed my light towards the sound and saw Will laying on the floor on top of a puddle of blood. Will, are you okay? What the fuck happened here? He coughed up blood and had begun to answer my question. The night after you left us, we finally cracked open that stone and some creature that we'd never seen before came out. It was tall, <coughs> skinny, and had a long head. I flashed light on it. And that's when the thing's eyes opened. Its eyes were completely black. The thing stood up and touched the ceiling. It was about eight feet fucking tall. I called the security guards up here. But before they could make it, it lifted John up in the fucking air and sucked some type of smoke out of his body and dropped him to the floor. Did the same thing <coughs> to <coughs> everyone else. Seconds later, after they dropped their bodies, stood up and looked exactly like those things you saw over there. When the security guards came, they shot it at it, and it got impaled right through their stomach by some tentacles that came from the creature's body. That thing. That fucking thing then looked at me and communicated with me through my mind. I lost my fucking shit when it showed me images I've never seen before. I disagreed with it and it impaled me through my chest, leaving me to die. I had no idea what to say and just stared out the window. Somehow I knew exactly where it escaped to. That's when I saw that all of the stones that were on the table had cracked open. It finally hit me that humanity was doomed. I ran back over to Will and, tr and tried to revive him to no avail. I just stared at his lifeless corpse and wondered what the hell I'd do next. I grabbed a gun off of one of the dead security guards and ran around the base to where the window that was shattered was. There were fragments of glass along with a trail of blood and strange footprints that led north. I followed them until a snowstorm came in. It was one of the strongest storms I've ever seen. The, for the horrifying reality finally hit me. I had no idea where I was. I ran towards the direction I thought I came from, but I got tired within minutes because of the heavy snow gear I had on. The snow quickly covered the tracks I had just made in a matter of seconds. I knew if I didn't find any type of shelter, I'd freeze my ass to death that night. I just kept walking forward until I finally saw something familiar. The site where we dug underground with the rest of my strength, I ran towards it and hopped in Maxium and decided to sleep inside there until morning broke. The rays of the sun's light woke me up. I checked my phone, which had read 9 a.m. It was sunny and the storm had stopped. I immediately got out of Maxium and headed towards the lab. When I got in town, I went to the news station to report what had just happened. Of course, they laughed at me and said I was insane. I then begged them to follow me to the lab. That's when a security guard came in and directed me out of the building. I just walked home, frustrated and exhausted. When I got in my house, I tried calling the lab but got no answer. Figures. It was driving me crazy that those things were out there, plotting something, but no one would believe me. 
I just decided to take matters into my own hands. I threw on some snow gear and brought some food with me, enough to last three days and headed to the project site to go underground and find some answers as to what I do. Within four hours, I was down in the cavern looking at the walls. I just saw the same pictures over and over until I went where we discovered those large stones. On the wall was a picture of a creature being engulfed in flames, looking as if it were in pain. I then knew their weakness, which was fire. I left the cave and headed home with hope in my mind. I stayed up all night in fear of having a dream again. Two days had passed and everything seemed normal in my town, besides the fact there was a missing kid on the news. I even stopped having those weird dreams until around 4 a.m. on Monday, I got a call from an unknown number. Hello? Hey James, this is Leo from the news station. We've, we've got to talk, man. Oh, so this is that asshole who has sent me out with his security guards? I apologize for that, but please hear me out. Lately, I've been having these strange dreams about some weird ass tall building. I even saw my missing son, but the thing is, it wasn't my son. It was some weird ass gray humanoid. You, you know, like the people you described to me, the other... I interrupted him and said I had the similar dreams. We both talked for about 10 minutes and agreed to meet at the lab within half an hour. It was 5.47 a.m. when Leo, a cameraman, and I entered the dark building. I told them to follow me upstairs. When we walked into the lab, everything was still a mess, but the bodies were gone. It was as if they never existed. I was frantic. What the hell? They, they were here just two days ago. I swear it. Leo told me he believed me but we needed concrete evidence for them to believe us. The cameras, all of us have shouted. We all went to the security room and took the tapes out of the TV. I took them to my place so we could watch what happened. When I put the tapes in, it showed nothing but static. God damn it, we were so close. Hey, we could still show the lab on the news, Leo had said. I told him that reporting the lab would only cause panic throughout the town. Well, we have to do something, the cameraman butted in. There's nothing we could really do, man. Everyone went silent for 10 seconds until Leo spoke up. Let's just contact each other if we see anything strange. They both left and headed home. The next day, a news report came on TV with people being interviewed about having strange dreams. They were all the same exact thing. A large structure in the middle of a snowstorm with people walking in and out looking malnourished. There were also several more reports of missing people. This made everyone in town panic. The grocery stores were packed with people getting supplies to prepare for a possible apocalypse. I don't blame them either. The night after the reports of people having the same dream, I got a call from Leo. He told me to meet him at the lab ASAP. When I got there, I saw him along with the cameraman I had met a couple of days ago. He told me to follow him to the back of the lab. He then began running through the deep snow and vanishing in the darkness. When I finally caught up to him, he handed me some night vision goggles and pointed straight ahead. Once I looked through the goggles, I saw a small structure that I knew just had to have appeared because I've never seen it when I worked at the lab before. What the hell is that? I'd ask. I have a pretty good idea as to what it could possibly be. We need to go check it out, Leo had said. I agreed with him. We then walked over to it. Once we got closer, everyone froze. The stone stood about 10 feet high. The stone looks just like the one we examined back at the base. I had broken the silence. It also looks like the structure I saw in my dream, just smaller. 
the cameraman then started snapping photos of what was in front of us. Now that we finally have evidence, we can get the fuck away from here. Once he snapped his last photo, something came out of the stone on the left side. We ran away before whatever it was could spot us. We finally got back to the base. I looked through the binoculars and saw an emaciated figure just standing right in front of the building. We got to warn everyone ASAP, Leo had said. Once we parted separate ways, I headed home. I was so exhausted that I fell asleep on the couch. I was awoken by an alert on my phone stating there was an emergency notice and the entire town needed to be evacuated. I was confused and just turned on the TV to watch the news. On the news, I saw Leo reporting live about the structure we saw last night. Pictures that the cameraman snapped popped up on the screen. After the pictures were shown, it cut back to a live video of boats for people to get on and leave town until it was safe to come back. I saw so many people down at the docks when I headed down there. It took at least an hour before I could get it on board and settle down. When everyone was off the docks, the boat took off. Leo walked up to me and pulled out a cigarette. I can't believe I'm actually leaving this place, he said while blowing puffs of smoke out of his mouth and sighing. Not even a minute later, the boat stopped. I ran outside and saw smoke coming from the bottom of all boats. The captain then came on the speaker and said there was a malfunction in the engine that will be taken care of shortly. I just leaned on the edge looking into the water, hoping to leave soon. Hours went by as I waited. Everyone began getting frustrated, yelling at the crew members, asking when we leave. During the commotion, I was distracted at something moving in the water. My entire body froze when I saw the figure rise out of the water. It was a thing I saw in my dreams. It fit the exact description Will had told me, but slightly different. This was my first time seeing its face. The thing had two void eyes that were black. It had a thin slit on the face that I knew had to be the mouth. There was no nose on the creature's face, but I knew it sensed my fear somehow. People looked at it one by one and began screaming. Everyone ran in different directions on the boat. I saw people on the other boats were doing the same. The thing jumped onto the boat and began picking people up with its arms and sucking something out of their bodies that appeared to be smoke. What I saw put me in shock. This man who got lifted up in a matter of seconds got dropped back down. His skin had begun to turn dark gray, while his body became emaciated, showing off his ribs. The man's eyes then turned pearl white. I tried to run away, but there were so many people pushing up against each other, trying to get off this boat and free. A man grabbed his wife and daughter into his arms and jumped off the boat. He missed the dock, though, and ended up cracking his skull on the anchor, knocking him clean out. His wife and daughter screamed in terror as they were dragged underwater by some tentacle. I then remembered the cabin's walls. Fire had shouted. The thing was weeks to fire, and I knew exactly what to do. I ran into the ship and got some oil from the very bottom. When I ran back up, I bumped into Leo. What the hell is going on? The only thing I said was, it's here. I could tell he knew exactly what I was talking about because his mouth dropped in shock. Give me your lighter, I have an idea, I demanded Leo. Without hesitation, he tossed me it and ran back up on the dock. There were already numerous counts of dead bodies and gaunt humans. I ran up to that thing and threw the oil on it. Before it could react, I lit Leo's lighter and set that bitch off as flames engulfed the creature. I laughed in victory until I saw the thing was in no pain at all. It just stared at me with those lifeless eyes and picked me up with his arms. Once I was in the air, 
I don't know what happened, but somehow the creature tapped inside my mind. What I saw drove me insane. There were images of some place that looked similar to Antarctica, but had way more of those things walking around as if they lived there. Out of nowhere, a meteor shower occurred and destroyed the entire planet. Very few survived, but those that lived were sent off to different planets. Their mission was simple. Take control of all living creatures that occupy it and make the atmosphere suitable for their kind's bodies. The tall structure we all saw in our dreams were for the purpose to control the planet's weather and create an arctic zone on the entire world. They sucked the souls out of anything that was living and controlled their minds, causing them to build that structure. The thing asked me one thing only through my mind without opening its mouth. It asked me if I wanted to die or become its slave. I yelled, fuck no, I'd rather die than be some mindless slave. The creature dropped me to the floor and shot its tentacles at me. Before I could make contact, out of nowhere a gun fired, shooting the thing in the head. I turned around and saw Leo holding the gun, breathing hard. Within seconds, the creature ran over to Leo and picked him up in the air, sucking his soul out of his body. There was nothing I could do except run. I ran and jumped off the boat onto the docks. I sprang my ankle, but the adrenaline surging through my body caused me not to feel any pain at all. Only a few people made it off those boats that day, alive. I ran to my house and locked every single door and window and ran to the kitchen, got all the food I could grab, and ran to my bathroom, locking the door behind. Now here I am, two weeks later, scared out of my mind. There is no more food, only water and toothpaste that I'm consuming. I can already see that structure behind the lab getting taller every day. I know it's going to kill me to, or take my soul I also know this is the beginning of the end for the world and all living creatures. These are the last days of mankind. Heaven and hell were all a lie. There is no God or devil. This is what we have come to and meant to do. The universe is vast. It's survival for the fittest out here. Humans were weaker. We always were. As I write these words in my journal for the last time. I am finally telling you all what truly lurks underneath the arctic void.